Good afternoon, everybody. Oh, you are so responsive. I came in, you know, I came in uh, from the other side, and the singing in here, I don't know, it just lifted me. I, I thought, oh, what wonderful. You're just full in worship, and it was like coming in amongst a great crowd of people. Well, you were a crowd of people worshiping God. Massive encouragement. Thank you. Now, if you are new here, um, we are in the middle of a series, Sunday morning series on prayer, and also as a church together, uh, we're in a season of prayer. So if you are starting this today, uh, if you haven't started it and you haven't got one of these, they're at the back. And if you're starting today, as Ron said, it's day 21. Don't worry about the other 20 days. I don't want to put you under any condemnation because as it says, there is none in Christ Jesus. So um, on day 21, all I would say is get started. This is a good week. They're all good weeks actually, but I'm going to home in a little bit on this week. So get started. Don't worry about the other 20, but get started. That's the important thing. Now, uh, we're we're focusing on, on hearing God. So we're going to turn to John chapter 10. If this reading is familiar, I picked it up in the autumn of last year, and so I'm going to ask you lots of questions about it. Now, I'm coming from a different, same perspective, but I hope it'll be different anyway. But it's just so pertinent, that's the point. So let's go to John chapter 10, and we're going to read verses 1 to 6, and then we're going to read verses 11 to 15. Very truly I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, He goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. This is verse 11 on to 12 now. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep, runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he has a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Uh, The reason this church began is because people heard God and responded. That's that's it. That's that's just it in a nutshell. They heard God and they responded. Uh, This is them. Uh, The picture will come up. Uh, You may have seen this picture before. It's on our website. And they, they... moved from Hayes Middlesex to Hazelmere. Now, whatever was going on in their thinking, there may be different ways that God spoke to them, but they came. And they came to an estate in Hazelmere, which is a big estate, and they saw it as a great opportunity, a great challenge for the gospel to break in in that estate. If they hadn't heard God and responded we wouldn't be here. I mean, it would be different. I'm not saying that God wouldn't have filled in the gap or whatever, but we wouldn't be here. It's because they, obe- they heard and obeyed God. We wouldn't have a multi-site church like we do with multi-services. We would not have that. And, and having said that, three of them have moved. That's Frank, Eileen, Maggie. They've changed residence. They've moved from High Wycombe to heaven it's a painful move for those left behind but for them it's a good move believe me and, uh, but the others are still here they don't have to be they are, but they are still here 
and I, they're still following Jesus. And I see them. They're passionate in worship. They love the church. They serve the people. They give themselves away. They've done this for decades. And don't for one instant please think this has been an easy journey. It's been far from easy. It's been a costly journey. There has been plenty of pain along the route. But they have gone for it. They will tell you, oh, so much has changed. They will tell you, oh, so much has changed. And yet they're amazed. They can't believe, well, they can, but they're just amazed at what God has done. And they look over us and they see these three sites and the number of people that God has broken in on and, and people saved and lives changed and transformed. All because they heard God and responded. That's it. This is really important. Uh, Frank asked me to be part of the leadership team of this church in 1990. And... Uh, do you know, I genuinely did not know what to do. Uh, there were uh, other factors in my thinking at the time. And I mulled this over for weeks. In fact, my wife said, why is it taking you so long to make the decision? I know where we should be. But, you know, wives are always ahead of the husband in these things. And um, I, was, I was talking with God about them. I wanted clear direction. One day, I'm driving in Wickham. I could show you the spot. Uh, I'm driving on one of the roads in Wickham. It's raining. Um, who knows a place is not at its best when it's raining? Wickham's no different. It was a miserable day. Wickham looked miserable. And I'm driving along this road and just God just drops it in there. No razzmatazz. No bolts of lightning. I just knew. I just knew this is where I should be. Because God just settled it in my heart. If I had heard an audible voice, it wouldn't have been any clearer. I just knew. I had this absolute conviction settled in my heart, this is where I should be. Now, why would the one who's created us with the ability to communicate, not want to communicate with you. Why would it? I just want to settle that point because he does. And what's more, he's good at it. He's good at communicating. He's good at speaking. He started the universe by speaking. And God said, let there be light. Guess what? There was light, absolutely. And God said, you got to get all Genesis 1, and God said, and God said, he's not short of words, my friends. Let there be a vault between the waters to separate the waters. And it was so. God is very good at speaking. And he wants you to hear him speak to you. So we come to this passage, I want to pick up on two things here. Why, why this image of the good shepherd? It's a good question, really. Why this image of the good shepherd? And two, how do we hear God's voice? So verse 11 goes, I am the good shepherd. Jesus uses a number of I am statements. You know, I am the bread of life. I am the true vine. I am the light of the world. It just goes on. And, but here he says, I am the good shepherd. All the other statements are impersonal. That doesn't mean to say they're not significant, but this one is about relationship and it's personal. It's organic, sheep, shepherd, life. It's an important thing to do, you know, when you come to the scriptures, is to ask, what did it mean in its original context? What did it mean? You, got, you must ask that question, otherwise you'll make it think what it isn't. So. Get the original context. Go back 2,000 years, villages, towns in Israel, there would have been a communal sheep pen. And all the shepherds in the vicinity would bring their sheep back at night time and they would come into this one pen. Do you know, it's a good use of resources, isn't it? 
So not everybody's got their own sheep pen. They, they're all in one, and you don't have one night watchman watching over the sheep. Great use of resources. Different flocks from different families pooling their resources. And in the morning, the shepherds would come, and each shepherd would have a different sound. And he'd make the sound, and the sheep would follow their shepherd. So when he made the sound, no one else is going except his sheep. They're following him. Jesus said the sheep listen to his voice. You know, they know the shepherd. That's the context. So when Jesus is saying this, they go, okay, I get this. I get this. There's a, a man on a train journey with a friend who is a shepherd. And they, they leave the station. And as they start to go out into the countryside, in the distance, and it's not too far, but in the distance, he can see some fields. And he goes, he's going to say to his friend, that's four of my lambs. It's four of my lambs there. And then he just rattles off the names, each of the lambs. You know, Dasher, Dancer, Prancer, Comet. Yeah, you, they're, they're reindeer, you do realize that anyway. <laughs> and it, one, the, point, the, the point is that this, he knew them by name. He knew them by name. Verse 14 says, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. I know my sheep. The shepherd, the shepherd really knows the sheep. And I think it's a great picture. You know, we pick up this, it's a great picture. But you know, when it comes to calling a sheep, I think that's less flattering. I hope you think that too. This is less flattering to call us sheep. Now, the, there's a the reason for this. I mean, I used to live on the edge of Dartmoor. And the sheep on Dartmoor, all the locals had a, another name that went along with the sheep. It was called stupid. Stupid. Stupid sheep. Stupid sheep. Because the sheep seemed to think that every road was a zebra crossing. Every road. And all along the road was a zebra crossing. And they could step out whenever they wanted. And they also had this knack. It's a great knack, didn't they? They had this knack of walking along the side of the road. Because the best grass, as far as they were concerned, was right by the side of the road. And so they had a nibble here and a nibble here and a nibble there. Stupid sheep. I mean, there's enough casualties. If you just walk along the road, you could see the casualties. Sheep. There may not have been motor cars in Jesus' day. In fact, there weren't, by the way. Just so I let you know. There were not motor cars in Jesus' day. But I can assure you this. They were still prone to wandering off and getting themselves in great trouble. And so are we. And Isaiah writes this. He says, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. Isaiah gets this. Now he knows what sheep are like. They all know what sheep are like. They all wander off. According to the co-op, the most popular song last year for funerals was I Did It My Way by Frank Sinatra. Jesus, my friends, knows what we're like. And we are good at doing it my way, not his way. Now the question is this. He knows what we're like. Do you know what he's like? This is really crucial for you. The good shepherd, it says, lays down his life. Verse 11, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Do you know, a, sheep, a shepherd would value his sheep. They didn't have bank accounts. They would value their sheep. Their investment was in their sheep. Every part of the sheep is valuable. Wool, skin, meat, highly valuable. Shepherd's investment in the sheep. Jesus' investment, guess what? It's in you and me. It's in you and me, my friends. He's invested in us. We, listen, we are his treasure. Please get that. We are his treasure. Don't say not me. We are his treasure. 
You can't get a stronger statement than this. Laying down your life. Laying down your life. That's what he has done for you. It means actually literally in the place of. Because Isaiah continues that line about going astray. He goes, and the Lord has laid on him. Not them, but him, the iniquity of us all. So Jesus has stood in our place. He died for our sins. You know, the one who creates the planets and the solar system, he owns it all. And he's bound up his heart in you and in me. I said, that's a wonder. Do you know what he's like? Do you know, he looks beneath the surface of our lives. Believe me. And he sees something so infinitely precious and so infinitely wonderful that nothing else but himself will do. Absolutely. Let me just show you this picture of a 3,000-year-old Assyrian carving. And um, it's six foot high. And it was part of a wall in a school's tuck shop. And it was covered by whitewash. And the dartboard was right next to it. And nobody knew what it was. It's just something. And this art professor comes in and he looks at this whitewash frieze on the wall and he goes, I think there's something really valuable here. In 1994, this was sold at Sotheby's for 7.7 million pounds. And for years, they never knew what they had. Don't you ever think you haven't got much. You're the treasure of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You are immensely valuable to him. He's bound up his life with you. It's a massive statement of your value. Jesus doesn't give you maps for directions. He doesn't give you teachings to follow. He gives himself. And he promises to be with you. And he promises you, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Wherever you've been. And whatever you've done. I'll never leave you or forsake you. My friends, he's the good shepherd. And he wants you to hear him speak to you. Yes, you. Even you. He wants you to hear and speak to you. Do you know it's possible to be a Christian and yet not expect to hear from God? You know it's a done deal. I've become saved. I know that Jesus Christ is Lord. I've committed my life to him. My sins have been forgiven. I know where I'm going. That's it. No, 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 no. This is a relationship. My sheep hear my voice. He wants a relationship with you. You've been made to hear from God. Actually, we've been designed this way. The problem is this. We're not used to it. We are born not wanting God. We are born not wanting to hear from God. During the Blair government administration, in the 2000s and, was it 1998, I think, or 1999 it came in, um, during one of the interviews of the prime minister, he was asked about Christianity. And one of his advisors, Alistair Campbell, interrupted the interview. He said, we don't do God. There you are. Should help you with our culture. We don't do God. We are born not wanting God. Having said that, we have been made to hear from God. We have. Whether, whether you have given your life to Jesus or not, we have been made to hear from God. Let me just read a little bit of this for you. Helen Keller was born blind, deaf, mute. She learned through the patience and loving guidance of Anne Sullivan to communicate, first through touch and then through speech. When Anne first tried to teach her about God, Helen said, I already know about him. I just don't know his name. My friends, that's us. There's an instinctive knowledge of God, a knowing that's deeper than language. It's almost like a shadow 
a rumor, a vague sense, but knowing God. That's why people pray. So many people pray, and yet they don't know who they're praying to. But there's this intuitive, there's this intuitive sense. That there's something and someone bigger than me there. This is a young man. He's in prison. And he instinctively understood what the Bible was all about. He said, I hadn't been long in my sentence. I was very confused. I was carrying an awful lot of guilt. I was looking for answers. I read a lot. I read Buddhism. I read Islam. I started reading the Bible. And the more I read the scriptures, the more I became aware of God. I didn't believe in God. Actually, I was an atheist. Well, at least I thought I was. But I came to believe that God existed. And the more I became aware of God, the more I became aware that I was a sinner. I got more and more desperate. He said, then one night I opened the Bible at the very first Psalm, and I started reading. And when I got to Psalm 50 and 51, I realized that God would forgive me. I didn't know why Psalm 51 was written. But the one thing I knew was, was this line in it. It said, save me from my blood guilt, O God. The God who saves me. And my tongue will sing of your righteousness. I knew that God would forgive me. I didn't know anything about Jesus, or the Bible, or the church. I just knew. I read all the rest of the Psalms on my knees. Almost from that point for me, that became Psalms of Praise. It was like beginning to worship, and I didn't know what worship was. And my friends, there's an instinctiveness in us. God is there. So, look, I, how do, well, how do I hear from God then? Well, let me say the primary way we hear from God, I know you've heard me say this before, so I'm not backing off. And it's this it's the scriptures, it's the word of God. You, that's the primary way. I'm not saying it's the only way. It's the primary way we hear God. So here's my line. Be serious about God's word. You've probably heard this before. But if you walk away with one thing today, please be this. Be serious about God's word. I'll say it again. Be serious about God's word. Read it. Reflect it. Listen to preaching on it. But be serious about God's word. See, in verse 4 it says here, when he has brought out all his own, he goes out ahead of them, and his sheep follow him. Why? Because they know his voice. Be serious about his word. He is speaking all the way through, from Genesis to Revelation, and in his word, he's speaking. Your word, Proverbs 4, is health to my body. And nourishment to my bones. Psalm 12, he says, the words of the Lord are flawless. You know, flawless. Why? They're like silver purified in a crucible. A gold refined seven times. I mean, this is, this is, this is a real thing. Flawless. The word doesn't fall in line with us. And what we think? No. We fall in line with what the word and what it thinks. That's what happens. Be serious about God's word. It's dynamic. My friends, it's powerful. It's alive. Charles Spurgeon would walk the streets of London. He was an English preacher in the 1800s. He'd walk the busy streets of London and, um, and then suddenly he would point to a hat on the pavement and he'd go... It's alive. It's alive. And all this crowd would come around him and he'd go, It's alive. And they'd think, What's underneath the hat? What, what, what is that underneath the hat? And he'd pick up the hat and there was his Bible. And he'd say, pick up his Bible and he'd say, It's alive. How many stayed with him after that? I don't know. But anyway, and then he'd start to preach the word of God to them. It's alive. My friends, this word is alive. 
Expect God to speak to you. He, he wants to speak to you. He's not short of words. He'll speak to you. He, it, it will get under your skin. It will disrupt you. This word will disturb you. It will wrestle with you. It will convict you. It will comfort you. It will encourage you. This word, my friends, will shape you. It's alive. It whispers. It challenges. It transforms. This word moves. This word breathes. This word is alive. Be serious. Be serious about his word. You know, reading his word gives us breadth. So I have a plan. I have a reading plan. And uh, I'm not as spiritual as others. My reading plan is over two years. All the spiritual ones do the... Are you one year on? All the spiritual ones do a one-year plan. I do a two-year plan. And, um, but have a plan. Read the word for breadth. It'll give you a breadth. Keep coming at it. But give it time and it'll give you depth. Have you ever noticed when a cow is eating and chewing? His jewels are always moving. It's called chewing the cud. And the reason they do this is because they must chew their food twice in order to digest it. So they chew it, chew it, chew it, and it goes in, and then it comes up again, and they chew it again and chew it again. And hence you get your creamy milk. That should put you off milk for a while. Anyway, <laughs> give, no, the point is, go at it. Give God's word time. You know, last week we went through the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Go on, take that line. You missed it, by the way. But, well, you can come back to it. You take that line and let, and let it breathe through the day. Come back to it. Tea time, break time, lunch time. Just let that line speak to you. You know, this week, I'm encouraging you, come to the passage. There are passages in here where, that are really helpful for God to speak to you. You know, one of the things I do as I imagine myself in the story, part of the crowd, one of the, or maybe an onlooker, or maybe a character, or maybe I'm just watching it from, maybe I'm the person who's videoing it. I don't know. I, but I, I, I'm, I'm in there, and I watch this going on. And tomorrow, you'll read in the passage, 1 Samuel chapter 3, that um, God speaks to Samuel. Now read it, read it, and get in the story. So for me, I had a quick look at it last week, and I'm, I'm in the story, and I, I'm, going, I'm, I'm going to be Eli in this story. Now, Eli's the priest, and Samuel's this young boy, and uh, this young boy has never heard God speak to him. But Samuel, the priest, he's got some, I mean, he's got some muscle. He's been there a while. And, uh, and it says the word of the Lord was rare. So I'm, I'm Eli in this passage and I start to think about it and here's what comes to me why him why, why do you speak to him God he doesn't even know you why not me why, why don't you speak to me you said the word of the Lord was rare why him God, you know I've got experience I've got a history of walking with you. And yet you're speaking to him. And you're not speaking to me. Doesn't what I have done count for anything? No, so I'm really starting to get in this, you see. And then some questions start to come to me. Have I grown complacent? Have my ears grown deaf? Am I spiritually deaf? Have I heard God's word and not done it? Which is important. It's really important. You see. Then I, I uh, have I heard God's word and not done it. Interesting, you know. After we had the giving challenge, um, so I did this video. If you remember, I did this video. 
Giving Challenge, uh, which was during our series of generosity. And if you're new here, it wasn't just on wealth, it was on a whole, uh, about our lives in, in general, our generous living, how to be generous in the whole of our lives. And uh, where we did two sessions on, on wealth, so I did this video on giving, and, and I, I'm going to I'm gonna look into giving. So I have a time when I sit down with Des, it was about a week later, and I said, we're going to sit down and talk, let's talk about this. And we had a really good chat, and we were t- I can see us, we were on our patio and chatting away, and we're talking about increasing our giving. And I, I, you'll find this difficult because for you, you won't have situations like this. But I'm just telling you mine, okay? I mean, you're, I look at you and I think, wow, this is a spiritual lot. So um, they won't, it won't be like me, but this is what happens to me. I'm sitting there, and we agree this amount that we're going to increase our giving by. We agree this amount. A week later, I'm going, I, I've got these thoughts going around in my head. And they're like... Uh, have I been a bit hasty? Uh, did we really get that right? Uh, have we pushed them out too far? Was that really God? And then um, I thought, uh-huh. You see, we hear the word of God and obey it. So the next day I come in, I come to our, our finance person. She'll tell you. I walked here and said, by the way, we're increasing our giving to this amount. We're, we're going to do that. That will start in June. We're doing it. And uh, Des gets on the thing to computer to the bank, ups the giving, done deal. Guess what? Never thought about it since. Just never thought about it since. Utter peace. Now, I've never had a second thought. There's something about obeying the word of God. It's really important. And it's God's word. So we, allow God's word to speak to you. Get, it, get in the passage. Read for breadth. Give time for depth. Give time for depth. You know, you want to hear Jesus speak to you. You can't always do this one in a hurry. You need to learn to give space. So how else do you hear God speak to you? There's loads of ways. There's uh, uh, dreams, visions, prophetic words, images, impressions. I mean, I I haven't got time. Dreams have been quite a big part of my life. But... I was speaking to Olivia, who was one of our young people. She's just been doing two weeks' work experience with us. And I, I said to her, actually, I was a bit clumsy. I said to her, we're in, we're in, the, it's in the staff area. And I said to her, hey, Olivia, how do you hear God speak to you? I like, talk about put on the spot. I, I thought, ooh, Neil, that was really clumsy. And anyway, she mulls it over, and then she says, you know, well, and she, dreams was one, and, and then, but she says, I hear God speaking to me through others. I thought, that's brilliant. Through others. Be in community. Get in community. When Samuel hears from God, he needs Eli to point him in the right direction. Get in community. You know, it, today, if you hear his voice, says in Hebrews, don't harden your heart. And then it goes on to say this, see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful and unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another. How do you do that? Actually, you can't always do that in a meeting like this, but in community, you can. Get in community. That's why small groups are so important to us. I remember talking to Frank one day. Frank was the uh, lead pastor of this church many, many years. In fact, he was the guy who, who founded it. The church started in his front room. And I, I thought I had this prophetic word, profound prophetic word from God. And I mean, and the word was going to be, I mean, it was just ridiculous beyond proportions. I mean, it was so miraculous that, I mean, he even made a miracle a miracle. I mean, it was so and it was so huge. And then, and so I said, Frank, well, should I, do you think I ought to give this or whatever? And he said to me, do you know, if I were you, I said, I'd just sit on it a little while. That's great advice. It never happened. I got it all wrong. I thought, oh, God, thank you for Frank. Just a word in season, a wise word. In fact, the project I was talking about just died in days, moved on. I thought, I'm glad I didn't open my mouth. But do you know what? We can tell people and we can run things past people. So community, it's so important. Read the word for breadth. 
Give it time for depth. And be in community. I want to leave you with this as we come to the end. We are, the Lord wants you to hear and speak to you. And in the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Can we just say that word all? All. Let's, let's all of us do all, shall we? All. That's. Is there anybody left out of that? No. It's all. And it's the prophetic, it's from Joel, but it's in Acts chapter 2. Here's all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they will prophesy. All. All. It's part of being a Christian, you know. You can hear God for yourself. I want to leave you before I go with this profound picture. And it's got great depth, as you can see. And um, could you just tell me who this is, by the way? Who? It's Sean the Sheep. Sean the Sheep. Sean the Sheep. I picked this up from somebody. I thought it was a great little line. If you've ever watched Sean the Sheep, you realize he seems to have this assumed role of being responsible for the other sheep. Have you noticed that? And if you haven't, get on to Sean the Sheep. <laughs> you get a revelation in Sean the Sheep. Do you good. So, so he has this assumed role of taking, over, taking on responsibility for other sheep. Here's the point. They're all sheep. They're all sheep. And so are we. And elders and leaders are not here to solely hear God for you. You can do this for yourself. You're all sheep. You don't have to go through a Sean. You are all sheep. Read for breadth. Give time for depth. And be in community. And let God speak to you. Thank you, Ron.